Um, yes, yeah, so I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Devin. I uh, um, don't think I've met any of you before, really, except for just a few of you. So it's really lovely to be with you. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself, uh, especially about my journey to faith, because um, I, I'm not a church kid. I didn't grow up in church. And so my, um, I guess my journey to faith was uh, perhaps a little bit different, um, but really it came through a um, very ordinary interaction. So um, I remember the first time um, really my exposure to church things was um, in high school when um, one of my mates invited me to his church. Um, it was a Korean church. And so I went along um, and the first thing they did actually was they, uh, they actually got me up the front of the church and they sang me a song. Um, and it was probably the weirdest experience um, in my life. I was so embarrassed. And my friend was just laughing at me. Anyway, that was my first experience with church. I thought I was in a cult. Um, and then actually, as I was going along, I, you know, I started um, kind of continue going to this church. Um, I was just, you know, there to make friends. And I just found it was a really great community. And um, as I started high school as well, um, there was a guy, there's actually an Indian guy hand, handing out icy poles at the front of Monash University, which is where I studied. And he asked me to do a survey and it was for a, um, a Christian club called uh, Student Life, which is now called Power to Change. And um, basically I got involved there and um, he actually, um, yeah, mentored me, he discipled me. Um, and I guess through um, my friends, um, these people at, um, at Monash Uni, I eventually came to faith. Um, and yeah, like I was saying to Amos quite early on, actually, I was so gripped with the gospel and, and the good news of Christ that this is something that I wanted to kind of carry into, um, into my life and I wanted to give my life to. Um, and so I, I guess evangelism because, um, yeah, that's, I, I came to faith by people really bringing me into their life and sharing Christ with me. Um, evangelism is something that's quite close to my heart, though I'm not very good at it. Uh, I think evangelism for me is one of those things uh, we love to celebrate. Uh, we love to talk about. Um, I love seeing people come to Jesus, but I'm not, I don't necessarily love uh, to do it myself, if that makes sense. Um, especially when it comes to those who are closest with me, my, my friends and my family. And what was really interesting, actually, what I found was I went on a mission trip to China a few years ago. And what we did there is, uh, we taught English in schools. We shared the gospel with some of the people there. And um, what was interesting is China's a really difficult place to openly preach the gospel. And as we went around, there was um, this uh, government official that would follow us around and actually video everything we did. Um, but the strange thing that I found uh, was that it was a lot easier over there to preach the gospel for me than to share the gospel here with the people I love the most. Um, and I was, I was reflecting on that. Why is that? Um, and so I came to the conclusion that I think here uh, we feel amongst our friends and our family, there's so much more to lose. Um, we're often scared of how the gospel might change our relationships with people, um, often for the worst. Um, you know, if they hate me in China, at least, you know, I can get a plane ticket to come home, hopefully. Uh, but my family, my friends, these are kind of long-term relationships that I've invested in. And um, when these relationships change, um, it often really hurts. And so that's the difficulty that the gospel message we know is at its core offensive. And it's always, I find it really hard to always be that guy, the guy that, um, you know, one, is always stands out as a little bit different. I don't, part of me doesn't want to push any buttons. I just want to fit in. Um, so that's why for me, um, evangelism in my own backyard to my friends, to my family really feels like the gospel going to a hard place. Definitely not the hardest places in the world, don't get me wrong, uh, but we should recognise that we do find it really hard. Um, so that's what we'll be looking at a little bit today. We'll, we we want to reflect a little bit on how we can equip ourselves to share the gospel with our friends and with our family. Um, we'll be having a bit of Q&A at the end as well, so if you um, have any questions, just share them into the chat um, and we can address them later. Maybe you can give me a hand too. So I'll open us in prayer. Um, Father, uh, Lord, please help us today to open our eyes to the wonders in your word and give us the wisdom, Lord, to apply it well. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles, uh, if you open them to Colossians chapter 4, um, Colossians chapter 4, we'll be reading from verses 2 to 6. I'll read it for us. 
So Colossians chapter 4, uh, verses 2 to 6. I'll read it. I'm reading for, from ESV. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open, a do- open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how um, you ought to answer each person. So if you look at, if you look in your Bibles, this section um, actually forms part of a larger section from all the way back from chapter 3, verse 5, all the way through to chapter 4, verse 6. And what Paul's talking about there is showing people how to live with Christ as Lord. Um, So if you track through the section, you'll see that living with Christ as Lord means it transforms how you deal with sin. It transforms how you relate to the church and how you relate in the home. But here in this passage that we're looking at, it also transforms how we relate to the world as well. So those who aren't yet Christian. And if you look at uh, verse 2, you'll notice that uh, Paul's asking the, the church to pray for evangelism for the apostles. So if you look at it, he asks um, here specifically to declare uh, for opportunities to declare the gospel, that he'd be wise in how he speaks. Um, So here he wants the church, us, to be involved in mission and evangelism, firstly through our prayers, all right? But now if you look at um, verses 5 and 6, you'll see that Paul now turns it on them. Evangelism isn't just the job, the responsibility of the apostles or the church leaders, but actually he's saying the entire church needs to imbibe this culture of evangelism too. Um, So that sounds scary, but we'll see that Paul puts it very simply. He says we're involved in this work too by walking and speaking the gospel. So that's what we're going to look a bit at now, how to walk and speak. Um, So you'll see that Paul says here, walk in wisdom towards outsiders making the best use of the time in verse 5 so paul says here walk as you go about your life we do it intentionally we walk in wisdom towards them so it's not good enough to just know the gospel to just know theology but what we what we're doing here is we need wisdom to apply what we know um, through the way we relate and live towards outsiders those who don't yet know christ And he says here that wisdom means making the best use of your time. So we take every opportunity to adorn the gospel. Through our lives, we're seeking to make the gospel look great to those we love, our friends and our family, right? And I think what that means is now every interaction, every conversation, every time I get to spend with them is actually a very precious opportunity to show them something about Christ. Uh, so for me right now, the, because we're in lockdown, I really treasure the times that I get to spend one-on-one with my friends, maybe in a cafe, even on the golf course sometimes. Um, I want to use every interaction, every opportunity I have with them to talk about deep things of faith and see how they're really going. But notice that in the passage there's an urgency because um, actually there's not that much time left. You know, I remember because um, a lot of us are young, sometimes uh, we can fall in the trap of thinking, you know what, um, I'll catch people later in their life, maybe when they're on their deathbed, and then I'll start preaching the gospel to them. But Paul says, no, it starts now. Life is short. Um, and I've realised recently that, uh, you know, I've had some friends that have recently been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so it's really brought to mind that life is short and we don't know when Christ will return. Um, If you look at research um, that's out quite recently, you'll find that so much of why the gospel is unattractive to the world, to people, is because of our inconsistency, the church's inconsistency between its message and the way it lives, Um, which comes, I think, from a desire to fit in, to... um, to be like everyone else, and I think that damages our witness. So Paul's saying here, we need to firstly live a life worth questioning. Live a life worth questioning. But if you keep reading, 
you'll see that the gospel about evangelism isn't just gospel walking, but it's also about speaking the gospel too. Because the, the gospel is fundamentally a message to be proclaimed. Um, so if you look at verse 3 in that passage, you'll see here that that word in verse 3 that the apostles proclaim and the word um, in verse 6 that the church must speak with their speech is actually the same word in both places. So the, the message the apostles preach is the same message we speak. But what you'll notice there is though it's the same word, there's really a difference here in how that word is communicated. So you have these apostles that have the responsibility to proclaim the, to proclaim the word publicly. But then we see that the church needs to answer for the word in everyday conversations. You'll see that there, that we may know um, how you ought to answer each person. So Paul's not saying in evangelism we necessarily have to gather our friends and family into a room and start preaching to them. But, through, but what Paul's really calling for here is that we give an answer to the gospel through daily interactions, through our daily conversations with our friends and family. So the process I think Paul's got in mind here is that we live a life worth questioning that leads to gospel conversations where we give an answer for why we live the way we do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that means then we, we need to be willing and ready to answer for Christ when the opportunity represent, presents itself. Um, John Dixon, he says that we're not all necessarily called to be evangelists, but we are all called to promote the gospel through our actions and through our words. So though we might not feel like we have the gift of evangelism, that's okay, but there's still a call on all Christians um, to preach and to promote the gospel through how we live and through what we say. Um, but, if, but if you look at the passage closely, you'll see what's really emphasised. It's not necessarily just what we say, but how you say it. So Paul's saying here, your manner really counts. He's saying it must be gracious in verse 6. It must be seasoned with salt. So it's about gentleness even when under criticism as well. Because the goal, remember, is, not, is to win them to Christ, not necessarily win the argument. Sometimes we might argue with our friends and we, as we win the argument, we lose the person. So how we say things is just as important as what you say. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you find this. Um, what I found funny is that um, when, we talk to, when I talk to my friends, especially uh, my high school mates, um, we revert back to our old ways of speaking together when we're together, right? So I speak to my friends like we're 16 years old, even though I'm now 32 years old. But I'm still, every time we, we see each other, we're constantly paying each other out. We're just jibing at each other like we were when we were 16. And even now I'm 32, I'm still doing that, just savage as ever. Um, and so I realised that actually the gospel needs to transform not just what we say but how we say it how we interact with people it's probably the same with your family as well sometimes i see people who are incredibly polite to their friends uh, but around their family they're quite a different person so we see here we need a consistency between our life and our speech everything needs to conform to grace so so i think what you need to know at this stage is paul saying that we need to make the gospel attractive with our words and with our lives. The call is to show why Christianity is the best way to live, why Christianity is the most consistent way to live, and why Jesus gives life rather than takes your life away from you. So, so keep that in mind. And now we're going to look a little bit more specifically at how we do this with our friends and with our family. So my first point with thinking about our friends is to live authentically. We need to live authentically around them. Sounds simple, but I want you to think about where our culture is heading, all right? So if you look at our culture now, we live in a culture of scepticism. So you'll see, especially um, around large institutions, trust is plummeting, and especially around the church, for better or worse. Um, if, if, think about us as consumers, you know, we hold brands to a higher standard. So millennials especially, they want integrity in their brands. So there's, for instance, there's a clothing company called Patagonia, which um, produces uh, responsibly made clothing. 
that, that, that brand has grown to over 600 million in revenue. But on the other side, we see a, a brand like Volkswagen, right? That falsified uh, the results of their, um, of their emissions. And that falsification actually cost the company, they estimate around $30 billion. We demand integrity in our brands. How much more the church, right? More than ever, we need authenticity. We need transparency in the way we live. Um, and here it's really about living wisely and being open with your friends. Um, this is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2 uh, verse 8. He says, so being affectionately desirous of you because we loved you so much, we were ready not just only to share the gospel of God with you, but our own selves because you had come become very dear to us. So our goal is that we don't just want to share the gospel with our friends. The call is to share our life as well. So Paul, was, he was willing to suffer for the church. He was willing to sacrifice for them. His whole life is on display before them. It's our whole life. Um, I remember talking to my friend and um, I remember she, uh, she was very, very hurt by what some people did to her at her church. But as I spoke to her, I remember her saying to me that she really didn't want to share those things with her friends who weren't Christian because she didn't want to give a, bra- a very bad impression of the church. But actually, as I look back on that, I think it actually might have been a really good opportunity to be real with them, to actually show them the ups and downs of life, showing them the reality of sin, but also the reality of forgiveness as well. And and I think it's helpful for our friends to see how the gospel is not just brought to bear on our successes, um, but on our failures, our disappointments, our pain. So I think as we're open, as we share openly about our life, we're actually giving people a snapshot into the real Christian life. That's not triumphalistic, but we're showing through our lives that Christianity is it's very livable. It, it can deal with all the ups and downs of life. So um, as we were with our friends, we can do this in very um, simple ways. If, if someone asks me what I did on the weekend, I tell them exactly what I did. I tell them about what I read in the Bible, who I read with, what I learned at church annoyed me. I, I want to give them a real picture of what I do. Um, I tell them what sucked about the week and how faith grounds that. Um, because I want, what I want my friends to see is not just, um, not just how the gospel shapes a religious action, but how does the gospel shape my identity? How does it shape my worldview, my whole life? Um, and so as we live authentically around our friends, as they see the things we're great at, the things we're not good at, and they see a real life that's repentant, and that seeks forgiveness, that seeks dependence on God, I think we actually show people that the gospel is a treasure for all of life. So they see how it shapes the way I use my money, shapes the way how I treat them as friends, how I work my job, how I use my time, my gifts to serve them. All right, so that's the first one, to live authentically. Um, My second point here is to merge your worlds, merge your worlds. And what I mean here is to get our friends to become their friends. Um, So Sam Chan, he's a a lecturer. He's also a doctor and evangelist in Sydney. Um, And Sam Chan, this is what he says. He says this. He says, um, imagine if I told you that while I was watching TV, a UFO landed in my backyard, an alien got out, and we had a chat. Would you believe me? Then he says, okay, Imagine if I told you 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, who's 100% God, 100% man, born of a virgin, who healed the sick, who brought the dead to life, who died on a cross, who rose again and one day promises to return. So, And if you repent and believe that your sins will be forgiven and one day you'll resurrect too. Um, Let's just be real. What do you think is the craziest story? You see, the reason why you'll believe the second story but you won't believe the first story is because lots of people attest to Jesus, right? While only I can attest to the UFO. So merging your worlds is about plausibility structures. So this is how the, this is what 1 Corinthians 15 is like. If 5,000 people tell me they had the same experience, 
then okay, I'll start taking it more seriously. And that's what we're doing as we merge our worlds, as we introduce our Christian friends to our non-Christian friends. We're giving them strong plausibility structures for the gospel. The more Christians in our life, the more likely we're probably going to take the gospel seriously. Is that right? Um, I'm sure you've seen this at your church. It's probably one of the big ways that we, a lot of us actually become Christians by experiencing Christian community for yourself, um, by seeing other people live consistently in the same way. But I must say, I'm not very good at this. Um, for the most part, I, I would say my Christian friends are quite separate from my non-Christian friends. Um, but think about it. What if, what if we merged our worlds? What if I did it? What if the next time I caught up with my Christian friends, I'd invite maybe one or two of my non-Christian friends and, and vice versa? Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I used to, we used to do Christmas lunch with my auntie in Sydney every year. Um, and, and, and they're not Christian. Um, they're actually into quite a lot of the new age stuff and, and all that. But what, what, what was really interesting is one year, I actually invited my best mate who is a Christian um, for lunch and, and he joined us. And we were just chatting like normal about life, about church and Christianity, everything. Um, and what was really interesting, um, at the end of the lunch, uh, my auntie's husband, he's a guy with, he's got tats all over his body. He's, he's like six foot three. He's got a massive beard. Um, he actually said to me, if this is what Christianity is like, well, maybe even we can believe it. Maybe even we have a chance. Because they see, not just from me, but other people, the, how the gospel is just lived out and, and it creates plausibility for them. Um, I didn't even know it at the time, but that was kind of merging my worlds a little bit. Um, another, another example, I, I got married last year and we had about 350 people in the same room can't even imagine that right now, hugging and, and kissing what whatnot. But it's, it's really interesting is that through the speeches, um, through how we interacted um, and through the whole wedding, actually one of my friends who, family friends who wasn't a Christian, uh, she actually came up to me at the end and she asked if she could come to my church, uh, which is very, very interesting for me because, you know, I think what she said was, if this is what Christians are like, if this is what you guys are like, then, you know, I'd love my family to be there. I'd love my family to be a part of a community like this. And, and what that showed for me is the power of just merging your worlds or bringing people together. All right, so another one is to merge our worlds. Um, another point here is to love your friends as friends. Don't love them as projects. Um, so even though we've been talking about uh, being intentional with every interaction, with every opportunity. This is very, very important. Don't treat your friends as projects for evangelism, but treat your friends as friends. That's how they want to be treated. And even if they don't accept your message, will you still treat them as friends? Will you still love them? It means that we're not here to just um, treat these people as a means to an end but we treat them as the end in themselves, that love is the goal. And when we want to see them through all of life flourish, and obviously the greatest way they can do that is to come to know Jesus. But actually there's a few ways we can do this, how we love them as people. First thing is go to their things before you invite them to your things. Um, my friend, he's uh, the founder of Donomate in Melbourne, which is about, he, he promotes organ donation and he gets people to sign up. And he's always inviting me to these events. Um, and I go to every one of them. I go to every one of them because I want to support him as a friend. But what I found there is that that empowers my invitations too. So when I go to his stuff, then when I invite him to my stuff, um, to church, to listen to a sermon online, he'll always do it. He'll always do it. Why? Because I, I, I want to treat him as a friend. So he invests... Not he invests in me too. Um, another example was um, I flew up to Queensland uh, for my friend's graduation. Um, I wanted to see him graduate. And so uh, the other day, uh, a few months ago, when I, when I told him that I had graduated from Bible college, from theology, um, he asked if he could please come to my ceremony too. How good's that? 
I think it shows the power of actually investing in people, going to their things before you invite them to our things, to your things. Um, another point here is to get to know them first. I think it's another way we can love them as friends. We ask them heaps and heaps of questions about themselves, what's important to them, what do they value, what are they excited about, what are they fearful of? And you know what? Generally, if you ask them those questions, a good friend will always ask you similar questions back as well. And what we're doing as we do that is we're taking them beyond the superficial and we're beginning to talk about values. What's important to you? So more than just what job do you do, ask people, why would you choose a job like that? Or not just what religion are you, but how did you come to be a Buddhist? What does it look like for you to be a Buddhist and express your faith? Ask not just what questions, but ask lots of why questions too. Because we want to get to their values. What's really important to them? Another way we can love um, our friends as friends and not projects is we invite them into our spaces, our homes, our things, things that are important to us so that they can witness our walk, just as you would do as their friend. Bring them into your life. Share your life with them. Um, the, last, the last one I have here is to learn your testimony in two minutes. This one's a really important one for how we give an answer to our faith is that we memorize our testimony. You should be able to tell people very succinctly and sharply, why are you a Christian? And it needs to be more than, I decided to take my faith seriously. No, you need to show them how does the message of the gospel interact? How does it transform your life in your words? How does your story interact with God's story? Um, so, I'll, so for me, my, my mission in life was joy. I wanted to be happy. I wanted lots of money. I wanted to just play golf. Life was good. Uh, but the pursuit of my joy had a limit. It was only as far as I could take it. And so as I started seeing, as, as my friend invited me to his church, I started seeing how Christian joy was increasing, was more enriching because it wasn't self-focused. It was actually other people focused. And what I saw was how Jesus redefined joy, not inwardly, but outward. Um, and, we say, and, and I saw in, in, in the book of Hebrews how Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. So he could be bound into a relationship with us. So it's Jesus' joy that drives him to suffer. And what a radical way of redefining joy. So that's just an example. It's not a dramatic story, but I'm just looking for simple ways to preach the gospel while I tell my story. So do you see how we can, through how we just tell about ourselves, we're actually telling about the biggest story as well of how does God through Christ redeem a people for himself? So memorize your testimony in two minutes. Show how it points to Christ. All right. So those are just some thoughts on how do we reach out to our friends. So let's have a look at family. Um, the first one, the first point I have here is to gain their respect. I think this is one of the very hard things about, especially family and thinking about parents, especially thinking about those who grew up in Asian households. There's a big issue of respect. There's a big issue of power imbalance with your parents. And it, it kind of makes sense, to be honest. Um, if you think about it, your parents, they're the ones who birthed you. They're the ones who fed you. They brushed teeth. They wiped your bum. And now you're telling them how to live. A bit weird, right? It's difficult because we're, we're flipping these traditional structures of age and respect. We're so used to them telling me what to do and not the other way around, right? Um, and as I was looking at um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, um, this is what Paul says to Timothy in verse 12. He says, let no one despise you for your youth. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But he says, set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, love, faith, purity. I think the, the, one of the difficult things with reaching out to your family is they see the best of you, but they also see the worst of you. They see your great qualities and they see your worst ones too. Um, and I, I think the question we need to ask here is, are we very different people 
around our friends than around our family, like we were talking about earlier. Can your family actually take you seriously? Do you have their respect? Um, I, I really believe that you can still be their child, you can still be respectful, and you can still be treated like an adult. So you lead the way, you lead through your character. Um, for example, my parents, they became Christian after me. And um, though it was like a lot of different factors, I, I'd like to think that seeing me change was quite helpful for them in considering to trust in Christ for themselves. Not that I did anything amazing, but I, I really wanted them to see how my life changed for the better. It actually made my life flourish. It improved my life. Um, so that's the first point. Second point that I've got here is to talk to them as parents. Talk to them as parents. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5 says, Don't rebuke an older man. Encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters in all purity. So what you find in, in this 1 Timothy chapter 5 is Paul's calling for different kinds of speech depending on who you speak to. So even though we might... Um, encouraging, we, we, even though we're trying to encourage our family, our parents towards Christ, we can still speak to them in a way that honours their role, their position as parents. And I think a lot of this comes through empathising with them, feeling their concerns and addressing them. So for a lot, of, um, I remember for a lot of people, um, your parents are actually worried about how Christianity is going to alter your dreams, maybe their dreams for you. And, and they might even take a posture of suspicion over what you do at church, over your beliefs, because they love you, right? They're concerned for you. So like I was saying earlier, um, when I first visited a Korean church with my friends, the first question um, my family asked me was, are you going to a cult? Do they want your money? Um, especially when I told them they, I brought, you know, I, they brought me up the front and sang me a song. That was a bit weird. Um, so... So, so for me, I, I didn't really want to come home and tell my parents straight away that the way they're living was wrong or I didn't want to do that to my family, but I, I was re very concerned with living amongst them humbly, um, showing them in my life what I was excited about, what I was doing at church, and so that they could start seeing Christianity as a good thing, not just something that was going to take my money. All right? And the last point I've got here with your family is play the long game. Play the long game. Remember, evangelism is not just a once-off event, but it is a constant engagement and engagement over many years. Um, we saw in the passage uh, in Colossians 4 that there is an urgency to what we do. But the way we do this is we want to chip away patiently. We trust God for growth. Um, this is how Randy Newman puts it. He says, sometimes um, we think about we need to get someone from A to Z at the very first attempt of evangelism. So if A is I hate Jesus, um, if Z is I need to find a bathtub right now because I want to be baptised, your job is not necessarily to get them from A, I hate Jesus, to Z, I want to be baptised in one hit, all right? Your job is that you want to seek to push people along, right? So we don't need to get them from A to Z, but you know what would be remarkable? If we push them from D to M. Um, so if I can get a family member from thinking Christianity is a scam that's going to take my money, if I can take them there to maybe a spot that, although I still disagree, I can see why Christians believe what they do, why they're not crazy, that's a huge win. And hopefully through many years of praying together, um, through walking, through speaking amongst them, we can witness our, our friends and family come to know the Lord Jesus. But remember that it can take often many years. It will need a lot of patience. Often we, we, we give up quite quickly. But realize that actually to be able to break down defeater beliefs at every part of the way takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of thought. Um, so play the long game. It can be many years praying and praying and walking and speaking. And then like we see in Colossians, it's praying for opportunities, walking the gospel at every opportunity. It's about speaking the gospel in grace. 
And that's what faithfulness looks like, that we want to be doing these things with our friends and family over a lifetime. Um, and it, even as I think back in my life, uh, I, I see how I was Christian because how some of my friends, they, they did very simple things. They invited me to church. They showed me what the Christian life looked like in very simple ways. And what that did was it made it plausible for me. I saw an authenticity to their faith. I saw how the gospel renews a love for people, how it leads to human flourishing, how it's the best way to live. I needed to see that first. I saw how it was a consistent worldview, how it could handle both success and suffering at the same time. And so I'm very convicted that God can use simple things like we see here, everyday conversations and how he can use that to soften. He used that to soften my heart and he led me to faith in Christ that way. And so I think what we're asking for is for God's help. We're asking for the gospel to transform us, that we would walk, that we would speak in a way that draws other people to God so that they would be transformed as well. So how about we pray for these things and then we can take some questions. Heavenly Father, we we thank you so much that we have this privilege of being involved in your work, in your mission to the world. Lord, we, we thank you that you, through Christ, are redeeming a people for yourself by Jesus' death and resurrection. Lord, we thank you firstly for rescuing us that, and we ask that, we would, that you would use us to share the message of life with our friends, with our family around us in simple ways, answering for the gospel. So, Lord, please um, open a door for your word in our lives. Give us opportunities to promote the gospel to our friends and our family. Open our hearts to you. Open their hearts to you as well. Use our weak efforts to bring them into relationship with you. Lord, we want to pray now for all we love who don't yet know Christ. We pray for them now to be saved, that your spirit would be at work in their hearts to open their eyes, to see you for who you are. So, Lord, please give us wisdom in in living amongst everyone, to take every opportunity. Um, Please, Lord, give us graciousness in our work that we may be faithful witnesses for Christ by your power, by your strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.